The community now known as Carpinteria has been around since before recorded history. It was first settled by the Chumash Native Americans who called it Mishapshnau. As this reenactment shows, the next name for Carpinteria came from the Chumash's carpentry skills. La Carpinteria, or the Carpenter Shop, was the name given to the community in the 1700s by Spanish explorers who were impressed with the Chumash's woodworking skills, making ocean-going plank canoes. But it wasn't until September of 1965 that Carpinteria actually became a city and was incorporated. In honor of Carpentria's 50th anniversary, here are 50 years of Carpentria news stories decade by decade. Official incorporation was September 28, 1965, after a fairly long and contentious uh, debate running up to the election. Those against incorporation didn't want another layer of government and more taxes. They're worried about property tax. They maintained that the size of the city um, was not sufficient to uh, really support the services that were being promised. And that ultimately, a uh, city council would vote to, um, to levy a city tax on properties. The county kind of really stayed out of everybody's hair and everybody was worried that uh, a new city government would have more planning and, and zoning uh, restrictions, etc., which was also an argument in favor of incorporation. Uh, the pro-incorporation people really were uh, anxious for local control, and that's really what it was all about. We were like the stepchild of the county, and nothing ever got done here. We never had enough services, we never had enough police, we never had maintenance, and but yet we were they were collecting some of our taxes, so we felt that maybe we should keep some of our taxes. The night of the election, all the candidates gathered in the robotized basement. Right here in this room, all the candidates that were running, we occupied this room. As a precinct would turn in their numbers, they would come over here and we would write down next to the name the amount of votes out of that precinct they had. Alan Coates, a former high school teacher, was the lead vote-getter and automatically got the position of mayor. The other four people who won a seat on the original council were Margaret Mills of Mills Drugstore, local auto body repairman Ali Olivas, local dentist Jim Gray, and local plumber Ernie Wolbrandt. One of the most vociferous um, anti-incorporation voices was Ernest Woolbrandt, um, who ironically was one of the top five vote getters, uh, was elected to the first city council, uh, ended up serving as mayor two or three times or and city councilman for over 20 years. He became one of the biggest advocates working for the city of Carpinteria and yet leading up to the vote and he himself voted against incorporation. So I'm John Woolbrandt and this is my mom, Mary Woolbrandt. Well, my dad ran for the city council, even though he was against incorporation, because he wanted to represent the people of the valley who also did not want the city to incorporate. He called himself the no-no guy on a go-go council. He was saying no to development, at least lots of development, and uh, the majority of the council was go-go, let's build, let's develop the valley. Not only was Ernie a councilman and mayor, he was also the unofficial local cameraman. And thanks to his diligence, we have his footage to enjoy today. Ernie just was the Johnny on the spot for any, any happening in the community. He, he was um, there to film it, to be there, to be... Um, I, I used to hear stories that he had uh, police scanner in his Jeep and he would listen and if there was something big and important happening he was right there. I think he was the ultimate um, civic booster. He was always videotaping long before you came on the scene. It was Ernie Woolbrand. He truly was Mr. Carpinteria. He really wanted it to remain a small town. I think the way Carpinteria is now 
is, has a lot to do with what he did way back then. Carpinteria's first city hall was located at this location, 4859 Carpinteria Avenue, currently occupied by DNA Design and Art. This photo is of the first city staff. Later, City Hall moved to 5096 Carpinteria Avenue, once the home of Kentucky Fried Chicken and Chewy's and now Cielo Restaurant. When more space was needed with the addition of the police department, City Hall moved to the corner of Six and Maple next to Colson's garage. In 1975, it moved to its current location when the city bought the property from Standard Oil. Finally, administration, public works, and police, as well as the city meetings, could all be in one location. The man who designed the original city seal was recently recognized by the Carpentry Valley Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for coming to the 57th Annual Carpentry Valley Chamber of Commerce Community Awards Banquet. The banquet honored Robert Perez, who 50 years ago designed the city seal, still in use today. When the city was incorporated, uh, they decided to have the, uh, the art classes of uh, Carpentry High School all submit their drawings to, um, to the board. And so from those drawings, they chose one of them, and I was lucky enough to be chosen. See, there's three rules. One was that they had to show the past, uh, the present, and the future. The Carpentria Museum was also born in 1965. Right at the time of City Incorporation is when ground was broken on this property here at 956 Maple with Provisor C.W. Bradbury, for whom Bradbury Dam is named, uh, secured these county lots for the Historical Society. In 1967, Carpentria knew that it hit the big time when the first signal lights were installed at the intersection of Carpentria and Linden Avenue. While there had not been train service to Carpentria since the 1950s, the train depot was actually torn down in 1967. Nineteen sixty seven was the year that the Van Wingerdens came to the Carpentria Valley. In uh, two thousand seventeen we are going to celebrate our fiftieth anniversary coming to uh, California. They had researched the whole United States to find the best place to grow flowers. They chose Carpinteria because of the incredible microclimate. They have Carpinteria has fantastic soil and Carpinteria has a fantastic uh, climate. And since we are flower growers, um, and have been since the uh, mid-1700s, uh, we recognize a good climate and good soil, and Carpinteria has both. The big flood, the 100-year flood, was uh, January 23rd through the 26th in 1969. It had been raining since the 19th, where we were getting over an inch an hour, sometimes for six to 12 hours straight, um, so that by January 26th, all the creeks had um, jumped their banks. And we lived next to St. Joseph School, and that water rose so quick, and so, but it was in the middle of the night where we didn't even realize that the water had come into the house it completely flooded the whole house and we wake up in the middle of the, in the night and we step down on the ground and splash and we're in water but just getting across linden avenue was uh, an adventure because the water was rushing down like a river up lillingston canyon uh, the pinkham milton uh, pinkham home was completely lifted up and washed downstream at least 150 yards or so with uh, Gail Pinkham and her three children inside the house. Uh, this was like about 6 a.m. in the morning, just a roar and a rush. All survived. We were all looking out the front window because Malibu Drive was underwater. And Mr. Ortega, and I think he had one of his dogs with him, <laughs> went yeah. up the street in a motorboat. <laughs> it was amazing. I volunteered 
because there was a lady trapped in that house that she was in a wheelchair but the problem wasn't so much the water was that there was also a bear trapped in there we went in with lights and uh, did our, and we never found a bear i was a student at the high school uh, it went right through our school flooded the whole thing filled the amphitheater to the top full of mud the driftwood went maybe a hundred 200 feet out into the ocean. Uh, there was everything you could think of on the beach. Uh, Governor Reagan came. He had a whole entourage around him and walked around and said, this is really bad, and he left. Even the National Guard was brought into Carpinteria and Lompoc both uh, to prevent looting. At least a thousand people uh, were left homeless. It was because of the 1969 flood that these these creeks later were, were channelized and lined with concrete to uh, allow faster movement of floodwaters. People per allowed development to happen right very close to creek banks and boom, all of a sudden there's flooding. And that often happens in this kind of climate where you have very dry spells and then you have some wet spells. Yeah, channelization 99% uh, of the time is not a good deal for anything. Uh, but it's that one percent, it's that that hundred year flood, it's that one time in a hundred years that you want it. The oil spill followed immediately on the heels of the worst rain that we had seen in decades. It was really uh, a one-two punch. It was an ecological uh, disaster that this area had never known. It is often credited with um, starting the environmental movement. I recall I was doing a job at the uh, right on the beach for a lady on the beach there and I uh, heard her screaming and yelling on the telephone. I was wondering if she was complaining about our work so I, can't, I had no idea what was going on and I knocked at the door and said, is everything okay? Because I could hear you yelling. She says, no, didn't you see what's going on? And I says, no, is there something? He says, come on in. So I went into her house and went to the, looked out of the back and it was solid black. Union Oil Platform A, which lied just about six miles off the coast, um, was drilling a fifth well. The well blew out and it didn't just blow and I mean it blew a gusher of oil and gas but then it also ruptured the seabed and so every time they would plug the initial drilled well um, it started leaking in other areas. So it was really really terrible to watch the thousands of birds being that died because they were uh, emerged in oil. It came ashore in Carpinteria um, it, it made landfall or, or harbor fall in Santa Barbara. It just coated all the boats, all the tree trunks and all the storm debris was on the beach. So now you've got oil slick on the beach, you can't just mop it up. It's all coated over all of this, uh, this tremendous debris field um, that stretched from Santa Barbara to Rincon. This was such a devastating um, disaster. The, the city actually went broke and had to levy a property tax to get operating funds to continue to rebuild. Carpentria had hardly recovered from the rains, floods, and oil spill when the Romero Canyon fire occurred in 1971. It started behind Montecito and came towards Carpentria. It really threatened the entire valley, um, the entire uh, foothill areas were being burned and the front country of the San Inez Mountains um, was all burned. It, it probably was the biggest fire uh, to occur in Carpinteria uh, in over 50 years. So the chaparral was ripe for, for burning. It came over the hill behind the high school and everybody would just thought the whole city was going to burn. Uh, my father was superintendent of schools. Doc Carty uh, was making the rounds uh, looking at the schools and, and I ended up on the roof of the gym with a garden hose putting the embers out. And uh, I'll never forget that evening. It sounded as though I was sitting by a large bonfire uh, and the crackling was right there. I can remember the Romero Canyon fire and the, what really sticks out in my mind, we had we were at the football field under practice. We had two of our players. Uh, I wasn't head coach. I was uh, Mike Warren was the head coach at the time, and they, and they kept looking over their shoulder uh, at the smoke coming out from 
towards uh, Toro Canyon and Romero Canyon, and uh, and and. So we're kind of losing focus for the practice, and finally the coach got a little upset, and he said, what's wrong with you guys? And they both looked up, and he said, coach, we have to go home. Said, what are you talking about you have to go home? We think our house is on fire. <laughs> Toro Canyon is notorious for capricious winds, especially with sundowners, and then when you get the firestorm winds on top of that, and a backfire came and enveloped four dozer operators and unfortunately killed four men. The the fire that happened has not happened since, and some people attribute that to the fact that, that there are a lot of avocados bordering the base of all these hills behind us now, and um, they're irrigated. They're not easily burned. Unfortunately, it is ripe for another fire in our mountains behind Carpinteria, so, I mean, of course, we have a lot more development that's occurred back there now. Um, more recently with the Rancho Monte Alegre and, and large homes going up in that area. Yeah, so we have to be extra careful. So I hope those folks that are using the Franklin Trail are being careful and understanding that it doesn't take much to get a spark going. In the 60s and 70s, one annual popular event was the Loyalty Day Parade. It occurred on May 1st and was in part a counterpoint to the Soviets' May Day Parade. The kids would dress up and they had baton twirlers and we had red, white and blue floats and all that stuff. And I remember Ernie Wolbrandt had his old army jeep and he'd always dress it all up with flags and different things. In the early 1970s, with the ongoing Vietnam War in the headlines, the Loyalty Day Parade was looked at in a new light. One year, uh, to make it more interesting and make it, it was kind of getting kind of boring with just the same old baton twirlers and you know per, uh, homemade per, uh, floats, that someone d decided to invite a Navy, some service unit to come and be in our parade. After all, it was a Loyalty Day parade, which was a counter to the Russian parade, which was really big. And people were, some people were thrilled to death to see the, a, a group of service people in the parade. Other people were totally against it, fuming, because it was warlike. Shortly after this, the Loyalty Day parade was discontinued. Carpinteria beaches have had their fair share of lawsuits, starting in the late 60s with the city of Carpinteria at odds with local homeowners. There was the lawsuit that was filed, and I think it was Roberts versus the city of Carpinteria, which was my father, and he was a named person, but it really was all of the beachfront owners. It wasn't just my dad. All of the owners along the beachfront had grant deeds, which described property that went all the way to the water's edge. The city maintained that there was a surveyed street out on the beach that was never built called Ocean Avenue. So the argument was simply, does the city have title to that Ocean Avenue because it was surveyed once as a street? Eventually, there was a settlement where the landowners got title to some of the land and the city created a public beach in front of it. However, another lawsuit arose a few years later. The Coastal Commission sued the beachfront homeowners between Ash Avenue and Sand Point, saying that they did not have the right to expand their seawall onto the public beach. This lawsuit was also settled. The Sandy Lamb Cove homeowners were allowed to keep their expanded rock wall and return for donating money towards restoring the salt marsh behind them and donating land for the future Salt Marsh Nature Park. The new high school was built at the end of the 1960s. Bill Carty was the Carpentria School's superintendent during this period. Well, Doc Carty was a superintendent. He just did a lot of things. He got Carpentry High School built up there on Foothill, and uh, he re they did some things at uh, Canlino School, the Early Childhood Center. He told me he never expelled a student in his 26, year, 26 years plus at Carpentria School District. Uh, they always worked it out. Superintendent Carty hired Jim Campos to be the school's first bilingual director in 1972. He remembers the program's rough start. I remember a particular meeting. The anger and the intensity of the meeting, both pro and con on bilingual education, was uh, 
I mean, it, it was, it looked like the whole community could just, you know, uh, was combustible. Unknown to Jim Campos and Doc Carty, there were still strong feelings below the surface relating to Carpentria's segregated schools a few decades earlier. The new bilingual preschool program they started was based on the theory that for Spanish-speaking children to do well in school, they had to first have a strong foundation in their native language. This new program was very successful. The scores shot way up and we became very famous very quickly. Eventually, funds ran out and this bilingual program was discontinued. Night room. In, in the late 60s, one of the, the fun weekends for myself and my brothers and friends was uh, my father would uh, uh, take us down to the old fishing pier and we'd stop by Reggie's Bait and Tackle and get our, our uh, tackling food and candy bars and Reggie had a rod and reel club that all the kids in carp wanted to join it. He joined his club, you got a little card and then he'd grab your hand and say fish grabs a hold and takes off. That was his handshake. I spent a lot of time at the end of Linden, my family, myself and and uh, with my father Doc Carty, uh, his avid volleyball player. Uh, later on in the afternoon uh, we may go over to 7-Up Bottling Company and get a free uh, bottle of Bob, great memories. Coming up in Carpentria's second decade, the city landmarks are designated.